Chapter 10 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 8, by John Hay. Chapter 10. Foreign Relations in 1863. The correspondence between the British and the American governments did not cease with the escape of the Alabama. Mr. Seward and Mr. Adams, throughout the year 1863, kept up a vigorous and persistent reclamation upon the English government, holding them responsible for all the damages consequent upon what they regarded as their neglect to prevent the violation of neutrality involved in the sailing of this corsair from Liverpool. Lord Russell wrote several elaborate dispatches endeavoring to prove that the british government had been guilty of no neglect and was not responsible for any damage committed by the confederate cruisers but he never argued the subject at such length as the american statesman he usually contented himself with brief notes couched in a tone of constantly increasing resentment and annoyance disclaiming all responsibility for any acts of the alabama and at last on the fourteenth of september saying to mr adams when the United States government assumed to hold the government of Great Britain responsible for the captures made by vessels which may be fitted out as vessels of war in a foreign port, because such vessels were originally built in a British port, I have to observe that such pretensions are entirely at variance with the principles of international law and with the decisions of American courts of the highest authority, and I have only, in conclusion, to express my hope that you may not be instructed again to put forward claims which her majesty's government cannot admit to be founded on any grounds of law or justice to this mr seward answered on the sixth of october in a dispatch remarkable for its dignity its force and its calm and friendly tone after a terse restatement of the facts in the case and the law applicable to them he said that the united states had insisted and must continue to insist that the british government was justly responsible for the damages which the peaceful law-abiding citizens of the united states sustained by the depredations of the alabama i cannot therefore he says instruct you to refrain from presenting the claims which you have now in your hands of the character indicated and at the same time he admits the difficulties and embarrassments under which her majesty's government is laboring and confesses that he does not regard the present hour as one that is entirely favorable to calm and candid examination of either the facts or the principles involved in such cases. He looks forward to a future time for a fuller and more satisfactory discussion of these matters, and directs the American envoy to inform Earl Russell that he must continue to give him notice of these claims as they arise, and to furnish him the evidence upon which they rest, in order to guard against ultimate failure of justice lord russell replied in a similar friendly temper saying that her majesty's government did not contend for the principle of equipping vessels in their ports to cruise against either of the belligerent parties but said they must decline to be responsible for the acts of parties who fit out a seeming merchant ship send her to a port or to waters far from the jurisdiction of british courts and there commission equip and man her as a vessel of war her majesty's government fear he continued that if an emitted principle were thus made elastic to suit a particular case the trade of shipbuilding in which our people excel and which is to great numbers of them a source of honest livelihood would be seriously embarrassed and impeded but while this discussion was proceeding the work of fitting out confederate cruisers in british ports went steadily on in april eighteen sixty three a steamer called the japan afterwards known as the georgia left the clyde with the intent to depredate on the commerce of the united states and in the spring of the same year the same firm which had built the florida launched at their yard in liverpool a new gunboat to which the name of alexandra was given it was apparent to the least attentive observer that this was a vessel of war and the evidence was overwhelming that it was intended for the insurgents of the southern states in this case the british government acted promptly and an information was filed by the attorney-general on behalf of the queen against the ship and the builders 
the case came on trial in june and was prosecuted with energy and ability by the attorney general the testimony upon which he relied went to prove that the vessel was constructed for a ship of war that gun carriages and other warlike equipment were being made for her that her builders had declared she was being built for the confederate states and that the persons who contracted for her and supervised her construction were confederate agents yet in spite of this weight of evidence and of the authority of the government which was doubtless exercised in good faith the lord chief baron gave this amazing instruction to the jury if you think the object really was to build a ship in obedience to orders and in compliance with a contract leaving it to those who bought it to make what use they thought fit of it then it appears to me that the foreign enlistment act has not in any degree been broken on which the jury of course returned a verdict for the defendants the case was at once appealed and proceedings followed which were extremely interesting from a legal point of view but without further practical result which need be noticed except that the alexandra never passed into the confederate service mr seward rightly acknowledged the honor and good faith with which the british government had attempted to prevent the fitting out of this vessel to prey on american commerce and said pending the appeal the president is not prepared to believe that the judiciary of great britain will with well-considered judgment render nugatory and void a statute of the realm which with its counterpart in our own legislation has hitherto been regarded by both nations as a guarantee of that mutual forbearance which is so essential to the preservation of peace and friendship if the ruling of the lord chief baron was to stand the inference would be that there was no law in england to prevent the unlimited employment of british capital industry and skill to make war from british ports against the united states undeterred we might rather say encouraged by these proceedings the eminent shipbuilder laird at birkenhead proceeded during the same summer in the construction for the confederates of two ironclad rams more formidable than anything hitherto attempted in england in the middle of july mr adams communicated these facts to lord russell saying a war thus has been practically conducted by a portion of her people against a government with which her majesty is under the most solemn of all national engagements to preserve a lasting and durable peace a month later mr adams wrote again in a tone of the gravest warning giving information of the progress of the work upon these vessels and again on the third of september he sent to the secretary for foreign affairs further depositions showing that they were nearing completion and stating that he had been directed to describe the grave nature of the situation in which both countries must be placed in the event of an aggression committed against the government and the people of the united states by either of these formidable vessels the next day he informed the foreign office that one of the rams was preparing to leave the port and on the same day he received a note from lord russell already three days old giving the discouraging and alarming answer that her majesty's government are advised that they cannot interfere in any way with these vessels mr adams at once replied expressing his profound regret at this conclusion and added in words of solemn warning which are rarely heard except on the eve of actual hostilities it would be superfluous in me to point out to your lordship that this is war but on the eighth of september he received a note announcing a determination which saved europe and america from incalculable evils that instructions had been issued which would prevent the departure of the two ironclad vessels from liverpool the government finally bought them and they were taken into the royal navy under the names of the scorpion and the wyvern it is difficult looking back over the lapse of a score of years after all these controversies have been peacefully and happily settled and the two great nations have been united in a friendship stronger and more durable than ever to appreciate all the causes of such action on the part of the british government during the summer of eighteen sixty three their disinclination to perform fully and with a cordial spirit their obligations towards the government of the united states received some explanation from the utterances of prominent british statesmen in parliament and on the hustlings during the year it was not only the consideration alluded to in lord russell's dispatch quoted above 
that it was to the advantage of british trade and british commerce to observe a strict neutrality which led them to the course they pursued the attitude ascribed to the british government by mr roland jacquemin of the judge in the fable who gives a shell to each of the parties in the suit reserving the oyster for himself preserving strict neutrality but fattening himself at the expense of both parties does less than justice to the intentions of the statesmen of great britain the one fact which we must keep constantly in view is that they disbelieved in the possibility of the restoration of the union and therefore however little they may have sympathized with the purposes of a confederacy founded upon slavery as its cornerstone they were unwilling to place themselves in an attitude of positive hostility to a government which they honestly believed themselves bound to recognize sooner or later as early as the autumn of eighteen sixty one lord russell said in a public speech that the north was fighting for empire and the south for independence that if the south came back to the union the fatal question of slavery would still remain a source of discord and that if the federal government should conquer the south the national prosperity would in this way be destroyed a year later mr gladstone announced from the same platform that jefferson davis and the southern leaders had made a nation that the success of the southern states so far as regards their separation from the north was as certain as any event yet future and contingent could be and in february eighteen sixty three lord russell said from his place in the house of lords that the subjugation of the south by the north would prove a calamity to the united states and to the world and especially calamitous to the negro race in those countries on the thirtieth of june in the same year only three days before the crowning victories of gettysburg and vicksburg mr gladstone said we do not believe that the restoration of the american union by force is attainable and added that he did not believe a more fatal error was ever committed than when men of high intelligence came to the conclusion that the emancipation of the negro race was to be sought although they could only travel to it by a sea of blood during the same debate lord palmerston took john bright to task for indulging in what he considered an absurd and fantastical idea that the union was still in existence that there were not in america two belligerent parties but a legitimate government and a rebellion against that government not until the final catastrophe came did the most intelligent and far-seeing british statesmen even among those who were at heart friendly to the united states admit the possibility of the complete triumph of the national arms among the leaders of the conservative party in england there was no concealment of their intense hostility to the national cause one spoke with exultation of the bursting of the bubble republic another now marquis of salisbury said the people of the south were the natural allies of england as great producers of the articles we needed and great consumers of the articles we supplied the north on the other hand kept an opposition shop in the same department of trade as ourselves after the seizure and sale of the confederate rams in the british ports it became evident to the richmond government that the british isles could no longer be made the base of naval operations and the refusal of the english cabinet to join in the overtures of mediation proposed by napoleon the third destroyed the last hope entertained by the confederates of recognition by england mr davis in his message of the seventh of december indulged in a bitter outbreak of resentment against the british government great britain he said has entertained with that government the united states the closest and most intimate relations while refusing on its demand ordinary amicable intercourse with us and has under arrangements made with the other nations of europe not only denied our just claim of admission into the family of nations but interposed a passive though effectual bar to the acknowledgment of our rights by other powers so soon as it had become apparent he continued that her majesty's government was determined to persist indefinitely in a course of policy which under professions of neutrality had become subservient to the designs of our enemy i felt it my duty to recall the commissioners formally accredited to that court a few months later this feeling of resentment was aroused to absolute fury by a letter which mr davis received from the british legation in washington 
conveying a communication from lord russell in which a formal protest and remonstrance of her majesty's government was made against the efforts of the authorities of the so-called confederate states to build war vessels within her majesty's dominions to be employed against the government of the united states after consulting with the law officers of the crown said earl russell her majesty's government have come to the decision that agents of the authorities of the so-called confederate states have been engaged in building vessels which would be at least partially equipped for war purposes on leaving the ports of this country that these war vessels would undoubtedly be used against the united states a country with which this government is at peace that this would be a violation of the neutrality laws of the realm and that the government of the united states would have just ground for serious complaint against her majesty's government should they permit such an infraction of the amicable relations now subsisting between the two countries the rest of the dispatch was couched in courteous and even kindly terms but this could not compensate for the injurious substance of the communication and what was to mr davis the intolerable outrage of the phrase the so-called confederate states he disdained to make any formal reply but wrote by the hand of his private secretary an angry response saying were indeed her majesty's government sincere in a desire and determination to maintain neutrality the president could not but feel that it would neither be just nor gallant to allow the subjugation of a nation like the confederate states by such a barbarous despotic race as are now attempting it as the three parties concerned belong to precisely the same race mr davis's furious epithets must have seemed to lord russell rather more ludicrous than forcible the letter goes on to say in an equal confusion of facts and of grammar as for the specious arguments on the subject of the rams advanced by earl russell the president desires me to state that he is content to leave the world and history to pronounce judgment upon this attempt to heap injury upon insult by declaring that her majesty's government and law officers are satisfied of the questions involved while those questions are still before the highest legal tribunal of the kingdom composed of members of the government and the highest law officers of the crown for their decision the president himself will not condescend to notice them mr mason gave up his residence in london with great regret he had grown accustomed to the official neglect with which he was treated and greatly enjoyed the hospitality of those whose sympathies or rather whose animosities were with the south but the orders from richmond were positive so he shut up his legation in seymour street and set off for paris unconsoled by the answer to his letter of farewell in which lord russell said i regret that circumstances have prevented my cultivating your personal acquaintance which in a different state of affairs i should have done with much pleasure and satisfaction mr mason afterwards called himself confederate commissioner on the continent but the title was not satisfying he kept coming furtively back to london continually hoping for an invitation to plead his cause in an unofficial manner before some member of the government at last through the intervention of w s lindsay m p he obtained an interview with lord palmerston this long-desired privilege put him in the highest spirits he could not have talked with more vigour and enjoyment if he had been in the smoking-room of the senate he talked only too much and too well lord palmerston's proceeding was cruelly socratic he confined himself to questions and the answers came in a flood mr mason told him the war would end with this campaign that the north could not replenish its armies enlistments had ceased and they dared not draft in reply to palmerston's innocent inquiry what they would do with washington after they had captured it he replied that it would be destroyed not vindictively but to keep the enemy at a distance the defeat of grant and of sherman which he assumed as a matter of course would be followed by anarchy in the north which would probably prevent any election from being held if held lincoln would be defeated now then was the time for europe to intervene and insist upon peace the north itself would look upon such action as a godsend the government would be powerless before the masses insisting on a peace i thought both he and i said mr mason could form a safe opinion as to the probable effect of such interposition 
when we looked at the broken and disintegrated condition of the North, broken into factions, its finances in ruins, and unable to replenish its army. Lord Palmerston replied that since Mr. Mason was of the opinion that the crisis was at hand, it might be better to wait until it had arrived. He had to be content with the true humorist's appreciation of his own joke, for Mr. Mason saw no jibe in the grave words, but reported them complacently to Richmond, expressing the hope that good might come of the interview. There was a marked difference in our relations with the power on either side of the channel. While an air of recrimination and almost of menace pervaded our correspondence with England, while the public speakers in that country, and in this, indulged in the bitterest taunts and reproaches, a tone of superficial friendliness characterized all our intercourse with the court of the Tuileries, and hardly an expression except those of commonplace amity can be found in the utterances of the public speakers of the United States and France in regard to each other. But, as a matter of fact, the government of the emperor was intensely hostile to the Union cause, and his smooth phrases of cordial courtesy to our representative served to mask a series of plots, equally treacherous and nugatory, against the United States. The Emperor Napoleon, in his address of the 12th of January, 1863, to the expiring legislature, referred in these words to his efforts and intervention in America. I have made the attempt to send beyond the Atlantic advices inspired by a sincere sympathy, but the great maritime powers not having thought it advisable as yet to act in concert with me, I have been obliged to postpone, to a more suitable opportunity, the offer of mediation, the object of which was to stop the effusion of blood, and to prevent the exhaustion of a country, the future of which cannot be looked on with indifference. And in November of the same year, a new legislative body having been elected, he attempted to defend in one paragraph his much-criticized expeditions to the two ends of the world, Mexico and Cochin, China. How, he said, would we develop our foreign commerce if, on the one side, we were to renounce all influence in America, and if, on the other, in the presence of immense territories occupied by the Spanish and Dutch, France alone remained without possessions in the Asiatic seas? Let us, then, have faith, he continued, in our enterprises beyond the sea. Commence to avenge our honor, they will terminate in the triumph of our interests." and if prejudiced minds do not divine the fruitfulness enclosed in the germs deposited for the future, let us not tarnish the glory thus acquired, so to speak, at the two extremities of the globe, at Peking and at Mexico. During the entire year, all the official utterances of the emperor were marked with a spirit of constant kindness and friendship toward the government of the United States. But the correspondence of the Confederate agents in Paris tell a singular story of treachery and double-dealing on his part, lacking as much in sagacity as in candor. Mr. Slidell had arrived in France in the earliest part of the preceding year, accompanied by the momentary prestige of his capture and release, and had at once established close relations with the French ministry and even with the Tuileries. While no official character was ever accorded him, his correspondence is full of reports of the most intimate conversations between him and the successive ministers of foreign affairs and the emperor himself, in which it is continually intimated to him that a recognition of the confederacy is only a question of time, and that it may be expected at an early day. These reports, faithfully transmitted to Richmond, excited the liveliest hopes in the minds of the confederate leaders of an immediate introduction into the family of european nations and though this feeling of complacency was troubled from time to time by the apprehensions of the emperor's covetous intentions in the directions of texas which were not entirely unfounded still the cabinet at richmond built their strongest hopes upon the benevolent intentions of napoleon the third both Mr. Mason, who was alternately basking in the light of social attentions in London and freezing under the studied reserve of the government, and Mr. Slidell, who was enjoying to the utmost the charm of life in Paris, as well as the intimate though unofficial converse of its rulers, agree in all their correspondence of this year and the next that the French emperor was willing and anxious to recognize the South if he could only induce England to join with him, 
and there is little doubt that these assertions had sufficient foundation though the official denials of both governments were justified by the fact that no formal or written propositions to that effect from france to england were in existence in the autumn of eighteen sixty two monsieur thouvenel resigned the emperor intimated to mr slidell that one cause of the change in the foreign office was monsieur thouvenel's lack of zeal on behalf of the south a reproach which seems hardly just in view of the friendly conversation reported between the outgoing minister and the rebel emissary on one occasion he had declared to mr slidell that the english denial of the french overtures in favor of the south was a mauvaise plaisanterie that the matter had been seriously discussed between the two nations and had fallen through on account of the unwillingness of the english to act the new minister m duen de Hayes, was found at first more pliant to the emperor's wishes in that matter the attempt at a joint mediation of the three powers and the final overtures of france alone were discussed between the emperor and mr slidell before they were carried into effect and in an interview at about this time the emperor himself suggested to slidell the building of a confederate navy in europe a suggestion which the rebel envoy said they would gladly avail themselves of if the emperor would only give him some verbal assurance that the police would not watch too closely the armament of the vessels to which mr slidell reports the emperor as making this shameless and almost incredible response why could you not have them built as for the italian government i do not think it would be difficult but i will consult the minister of marine about it the relations thus set foot between the confederate legation and the officers of the french empire continued in a manner which cannot but excite the amazement of any one who reads the letters of slidell to his government it is impossible to regard all these reports as mere mystification certainly in the end to be detected they must therefore be received with the same credit given to the reports of any other minister to his home government mr slidell says he kept in his pay an official in the french ministry of foreign affairs with the knowledge and sanction of monsieur Drain de Hoys, receiving all the information he needed from this person the minister while he talked freely enough with mr slidell preferred to say that the building of the ships was a matter out of his jurisdiction belonging rather to that of the minister of commerce or of marine that it was better that he should know nothing of it and that he was quite willing to close his eyes until some direct appeal was made to him the minister of marine who was less liable to embarrassing inquiries from mr dayton was therefore less punctilious in his conversations with mr slidell and unhesitatingly told him that if the confederates built ships of war in french ports they should be permitted to arm and equip them and go to sea mr slidell further says that on the twenty third of february he called by appointment a monsieur rouer minister of state a man so powerful in the imperial councils that he was usually called the vice emperor with monsieur verrouz deputy from nantes the express object of the visit being to receive from monsieur rouer the distinct assurance that if we were to build ships of war in french ports we should be permitted to arm and equip them and proceed to sea this assurance says slidell was given by him and so soon as the success of the erlanger loan is established i shall write to messrs maury and bullock recommending them to come here for the purpose of ascertaining whether they can make satisfactory contracts this erlanger loan the most successful of all the financial operations of the confederates in europe was directly promoted by the emperor in france after the minister of foreign affairs had declined to permit it to be advertised in the paris papers his objections were overcome by the direct command of the emperor considering the reputation which the emperor enjoyed among the public men of europe for his supposed talent of keeping his own counsels he exhibited a surprising recklessness in this affair while giving mr dayton constant assurances of his friendship for the united states he talked with the utmost freedom of his warm sympathy towards the southern cause with confederate envoys with members of parliament and even with casual british tourists who all reported his conversation with the utmost promptitude to mr slidell or directly to mr davis in richmond it was not enough for him to intimate to the rebel envoys that the construction of ships in french ports would be winked at 
but he took the manufacturers themselves directly into his confidence m Armand, the eminent shipbuilder of bordeaux went directly to the emperor and received from him the positive assurance which he was authorized to convey to mr slidell that no difficulties would be made in the matter m Armand suggested that mr slidell would probably not be satisfied with any assurance he did not receive directly from the emperor and asked if an audience could not be granted him for this purpose mr slidell had already received from the emperor a most gratifying and characteristic proof of his sympathy he sent him by the hands of m mocard his private secretary a copy of a confidential telegraphic dispatch from adams to dayton advising him of the sailing of the confederate steamer japan from england to france the dispatch had been stolen from the wires by the french government and by the emperor himself laid before mr slidell before it was read by mr dayton he naturally felt after this so sure of his standing at the tuileries that captain bullark entered at once into provisional contracts for the building of four corvettes and two ironclads mr slidell obtained his promised interview with the emperor on the eighteenth of june in the course of this conversation mr slidell regarding the matter as arranged expressed his thanks to the emperor for his sanction of the contract made for the building of four ships of war at bordeaux and nantes and informed him that they were now prepared to build several ironclad ships in france and that he only required his verbal assurances that they should be allowed to proceed to sea under the confederate flag to enter into the contracts for that purpose this language is quoted textually from mr slidell's dispatch to richmond as well as what follows from the emperor the latter said that we might build the ships but it would be necessary that their destination should be concealed his majesty had evidently taken no offence at the cynicism of the envoy's proposition the definite contracts were then signed and the work on the ships went rapidly forward but it was not only in relation to naval matters that mr slidell kept up his curious intimate relations with the emperor in this same interview on the eighteenth of june the entire subject of the recognition of the confederacy by france either jointly or in company with england was fully discussed between napoleon and slidell the emperor constantly expressing his fear that england desired to embroil him in war with the united states and slidell continually assuring him that with his navy he could conquer a peace in a moment there seems no limit to the indiscretions of both parties mr slidell went so far as to ask the emperor whether he preferred to see the whigs or tories in power in england to which his majesty replied that he rather preferred the whigs the tories are very good friends of mine he said when in the minority but their tone changes very much when they get into power mr slidell showed him a letter from messrs roebuck and lindsay two members of parliament who were ardently devoted to the cause of the south and asked the emperor if he would receive them to which he unhesitatingly assented but after a little reflection added i think that i can do something better make a direct proposition to england for joint recognition this will effectually prevent lord palmerston from misrepresenting my position and wishes on the american question he promised to bring the matter before the cabinet and two days later mr slidell received a confidential letter from m mocard dictated by the emperor saying m drun de Huys has written to baron gross our ambassador in london to sound lord palmerston on the question of recognition of the south and is authorized to declare that the cabinet of the tuileries is ready to discuss the subject a few days later in accordance with the arrangements which slidell had made the famous interview of roebuck and lindsay with the emperor took place at fontainebleau the emperor talked with these ardent advocates of the south in a tone of inconceivable indiscretion roebuck reported the conversation with equal recklessness to slidell before leaving paris and repeated it soon afterwards from his place in the house of commons claiming that he was authorized by napoleon the third to state publicly that he was ready to recognize the confederacy that he had urged the british government to such action and that the emperor was chagrined at the discourteous treatment he had received from the british cabinet in not only rejecting his overtures but denying that they had been made and then communicating them to the washington cabinet the british government of course gave a categorical denial to all the assertions of mr roebuck's extraordinary speech and the emperor in his turn 
coolly joined in giving the lie to the unfortunate amateur diplomatists he sent it is true through m bocard a note to mr slidell making an attempt to explain some of the contradictions in this tangled web of falsehood and expressly stating that the morning after the interview with roebuck and lindsay the minister of foreign affairs sent a telegraphic dispatch to baron Gros to inform lord palmerston unofficially that if england was disposed to recognize the south the emperor was inclined to follow her in that path a fact which was made public in the moniteur at the same time mr slidell's agent in the ministry of foreign affairs told him that m Droyen de la hoys had read to him a part of a letter from the emperor in which after giving him the instructions above referred to in regard to baron gross the emperor added i question whether i ought not to say officially to lord palmerston that i have decided to recognize the confederate states but all these thick woven cobwebs of intrigue and diplomacy were blown to pieces a few days later when the thunder of the guns of gettysburg and vicksburg came echoing over the ocean the year went on in alteration of hope and discouragement to mr slidell he writes on one day with exultation that the archduke maximilian is ready to form a treaty of alliance offensive and defensive with the southern confederacy on another that the emperor at a court ball has distinguished him and his family with extraordinary marks of favor on another that his ironclads are almost ready for sea but in november his suspicions in regard to the good faith of napoleon the third became aroused and he wrote a note directly to the emperor expressing his fear that orders might be given without the emperor's being consulted which would interfere with the completion and armament of the ships of war in construction at bordeaux and nantes for the government of the confederate states the undersigned he says has the most entire confidence that your majesty being made aware of the possibility of such an interference will take the necessary steps to prevent it the undersigned has no access to the minister of marine and does not feel authorized to state to the minister of foreign affairs the circumstances under which the construction of these ships was commenced he relies upon this reason to excuse the liberty which he has ventured to take in addressing himself directly to your majesty on a subject in which are involved not only vital interests of the government which he represents but very grave and delicate personal responsibilities for himself the emperor who by this time had probably been made to see the indiscretion of his irregular relations with the confederate envoy handed this note to m Dryan de la hoise who at once sent for mr slidell he seemed at first says mr slidell to take a rather high tone saying that what had passed with the emperor was confidential that france could not be forced into a war by indirection that when prepared to act it would be openly and that peace with the north should not be jeopardized on an accessory and unimportant point such as the building of one or two vessels that france was bound by the declaration of neutrality mr slidell who was not disposed to rest silently under the imputation of intrusion upon the emperor then gave the minister a detailed history of the affair showing him that the idea originated with the emperor and was carried out not only with his knowledge and approbation but at his invitation that it was so far confidential that it was to be communicated only to a few necessary persons but that this could not deprive him of the right of invoking as he did an inheritance to promises which had been given long after the declaration of neutrality the interview ended more amicably than it had begun m Droyen de la hoye expressing his sympathy with the south and his regret that on account of the opposition of england they could not take more efficacious steps to assist the confederacy it was not long however before the apprehensions of mr slidell and captain bullock confederate naval agent in europe were shown to have been well founded m vorouz deputy of nantes who had been employed in company with m armand to build two corvettes came hurriedly to paris in november when the rams were three-fifths finished and the corvettes almost ready for sea to inform the confederate emissaries that one of his confidential clerks had disappeared and had carried off the letters and papers pertaining to this business they all took it for granted that these compromising documents would soon fall into the hands of the united states legation which proved to be the case and when mr dayton presented this damaging evidence to the ministry of foreign affairs both m droyen de la hoye and his colleague of the marine were properly shocked and surprised 
the minister of the united states received the most satisfactory assurances and the work on the ships went steadily on neither captain bullock nor mr slidell imagined that this discovery would put an end to their enterprise the former wrote to mr mallory the french government has only thus become aware of a transaction it was perfectly well informed of before indeed i may say that the attempt to build ships in france was undertaken at the instigation of the imperial government itself and it was of course impossible at first for mr slidell to believe that the repeated assurances he had received from the most august personage in the empire were to go for nothing simply because a clerk had run away with some letters the minister of marine had expressly authorized by an official document not only the construction of the four corvettes but their arming with twelve or fourteen guns each canon de tente even when the order was given that the vessels should not leave the ports of france but must be sold to other parties mr slidell still imagined that some trick would be devised by which they could go to sea so late as the sixteenth of february eighteen sixty four mr slidell writing to his government that the ministry of marine had informed him that the sailing of the vessels would be an act of open hostility to the united states did not yet believe in the full extent of the disaster which had overtaken him he admits the necessity of the nominal sale but still trusts to the chapter of accidents and the friendship of the emperor and proposes to go on and complete the ships he cannot conceive that the government means unkindly to him the contract for the corvettes he says was concluded only after the official consent to their armament and sailing was given by the minister of marine and this was given on the representation that they were intended for commercial purposes although their real character and destination were fully known to him he however reluctantly signing the order in obedience to superior authority it was agreed between armand and captain bullock that the sale of the corvette should be purely fictitious and that the negotiations in respect to the ram should be kept in such a state that the confederates might get possession of them again if there should be any change in the policy of the emperor's government trusting that this arrangement would be carried out captain bullock went to liverpool where on the ninth of june he received a letter from armand informing him that he had sold both the rams and the corvettes to governments of the north of europe in obedience to the imperative orders of his government he said he could not write particulars but his messenger gave this verbal explanation Monsieur Armand had obtained his promised interview with the emperor, who rated him severely, threatened imprisonment, ordered him to sell the ships at once, bona fide, and that if this was not done, he would have them seized and taken to Rochefort. A similar order was sent to Monsieur Voruz at Nantes, from the Minister of Marine, written, says Captain Bullock, in a style of virtuous indignation specifying the general arrangements of the ships as proving their warlike character and dogmatically pronounces the one to which he especially refers un veritable corvette de guerre even after this wreck of his hopes after the minister of marine in an interview with mr slidell had informed him that he had kept his eyes shut as long as he could and that he had assisted him in every way possible but that now he had been ordered to turn over matters connected with the confederate navy to the minister of foreign affairs mr slidell was still able to believe that the emperor had been true to him i am sure he said that the builders were never forced to sell them to third parties and that no pressure for that object was ever exercised toward them by the government the builder of the bordeaux ships did as i was informed make assertions to that effect but i am fully convinced that they were pure fictions gotten up to subserve his own views the other emissaries did not share in this rosy view of the imperial friendship mason wrote we have been utterly duped by that power and worse captain bullock calls it a case of simple deception and gives as the reason why the government at richmond always refrained from making these transactions public that the effect would have been to alienate the sympathies of the imperial government which mr slidell was assured were still with the south it is evident that the emperor had changed his mind in regard to the comparative desirability of the friendship of the united states and the confederacy the steady progress of the union arms had at last caused even napoleon the third to modify his sanguine hopes of the downfall of the american republic he had no desire to commit himself further 
in the path that became every day hedged round with new difficulties and he availed himself probably without reluctance of the opportunity afforded by the energetic action of mr dayton to free himself from the entanglement with mr slidell end of chapter ten chapter eleven of abraham lincoln a history volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by florence short abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay chapter eleven o lusty and the red river the war during the early part of eighteen sixty four brought little of glory or profit to the union arms there were numberless marches and countermarches many insignificant engagements resulting in nothing but the only events not otherwise mentioned which are especially worth recording were two somewhat serious reverses to the national cause both of them in the southernmost tier of the states one in florida and one in louisiana early in the winter of eighteen sixty three sixty four general gilmore commanding the department of the south announced to the government at washington his intention of beginning active operations in his department and was authorized to act according to his own judgment and discretion he therefore resolved upon an expedition into florida to take possession of such portions of the eastern and northern sections of the state as could be easily held by small garrisons he hoped by this to accomplish several objects such as to procure an outlet for cotton lumber timber and to open up the trade of the st john's river to cut off a source of commissary supplies to the enemy to obtain recruits for his colored regiments and enough white volunteers for at least one regiment he afterwards added another detail to his plan to assist in bringing florida back into the union in accordance with the president's proclamation of december eighth eighteen sixty three this came in time to be regarded by the opponents of the administration as the sole purpose of the expedition and mr lincoln has received a great deal of unjust censure for having made a useless sacrifice of life for a political end his only connection with the matter can be briefly given when general gilmore's intention to move into the interior was made known at washington one of the president's secretaries who had formerly served for a few months on general hunter's staff as a volunteer and had many acquaintances in that department asked leave to accompany the expedition the president at the suggestion of the secretary of war gave him a commission as assistant adjunct general and charged him with a special errand which will be best explained by the letter which he carried to general gilmore i understand an effort is being made by some worthy gentleman to reconstruct a loyal state government in florida florida is in your department and it is not unlikely that you may be there in person i have given mr hay a commission of major and sent him to you with some blank books and other blanks to aid in the reconstruction he will explain as to the manner of using the blanks and also my general views on the subject it is desirable for all to cooperate but if irreconcilable differences of opinion shall arise you are master i wish the thing done in the most speedy way possible so that when done it lie within the range of the late proclamation on the subject the detail labor of course will have to be done by others but i shall be greatly obliged if you will give it such general supervision as you can find consistent with your most strictly military duties in accordance with this letter major hay was ordered to proceed to fernandina and other convenient points in florida for the purpose of extending to the citizens of the state an opportunity of availing themselves of the president's proclamation by signing the oath of allegiance contained in it and of enrolling themselves as loyal citizens for the purposes mentioned in the proclamation the special duties assigned him occupied little time there were few loyal citizens to enroll 
The most of his service was as an ordinary staff officer to General Gilmore, and there need be no further mention of him except to say that the movement to restore a legal state government for Florida at that time failed for lack of material. The expedition to Florida was under the immediate charge of General Truman Seymour, an accomplished and gallant officer of the regular army. He landed at Jacksonville and pushed forward his mounted force twenty miles to Baldwin, the junction of the two railroads to Fernandina and Jacksonville. The march was highly successful. Colonel Guy V. Henry, having captured eight of the enemy's guns and a large amount of stores, wagons, and horses. Gilmore himself arrived at Baldwin on the ninth of February, and after a full conference and, as he thought, understanding with Seymour, returned to Jacksonville. From there he telegraphed to Seymour on the 11th, not to risk a repulse in advancing on Lake City, but to hold Sanderson's, unless there were reasons for falling back. He reiterated his orders to concentrate at Baldwin, and then went back to Hilton Head. On the 18th, he was surprised at receiving a letter from Seymour, dated the day before, announcing his intention of moving at once to the Suwannee River without supplies, and asking for a strong demonstration of the Army and Navy in the Savannah River to assist his movement. This news was all the more amazing to Gilmore, because Seymour, who had all along been opposed to the movement and thought that there was no desire on the part of florida to return to the union now thought the floridians were tired of the war and if kindly treated would soon come back gilmore wrote a peremptory letter ordering him to restrict himself to holding baldwin and the south prong of the st mary's river and occupying palatka and magnolia and dispatched a staff officer to florida with it he arrived too late seymour had made up his mind that there was less risk in going forward than in staying at baldwin and like the brave and devoted soldier that he was had resolved to take the responsibility he marched rapidly out towards olusky where the enemy under general joseph finnegan was supposed to be but came upon them unexpectedly about two miles east of that place the forces were equal in numbers about fifty five hundred on each side the advantage to the confederates was that they were in a strong position selected by themselves and ready for the fight general j r hawley who commanded a brigade of infantry in the battle says we rushed in not waiting for the proper full formation and were fought in detail seymour made a gallant fight of it the national artillery did good service but to attack an equally brave enemy in position requires a superiority of force and Seymour's attack was constantly repulsed with heavy loss, until at nightfall he fell back to a new line. He was not pursued, and retired in good order and unmolested to Jacksonville. The Union loss was 1,861, the Confederate 940. This misadventure put an end for the moment to the attempt to occupy Florida. General Gilmore soon afterwards asked that he might be ordered to Virginia to take part in the campaign then opening, an order which General Grant gladly gave. Seymour also went north and was involved in the attack on Meade's right wing in the wilderness, and was thus once more unfortunate. But, whatever his misfortunes, he never lost the respect and esteem of his brother officers as a man of honor, of courage, and of ability the calumnies of a political nature and origin which at one time were rife in the press against him do not even deserve a refutation in the summer of eighteen sixty three the situation in mexico had assumed so threatening an attitude that mr seward thought it a matter of the utmost urgency to restore the united states flag to some point in texas in view of the plan of napoleon III for the establishment of an empire on our southwestern border it was every way desirable that the archduke maximilian should not find on landing in his new dominion the adjoining state entirely void of any vestige of the national authority general banks although anxious to proceed at once to the capture of mobile was instructed first to hoist the flag in some point of texas with the least possible delay 
the point to be selected was nominally left to his own discretion but general halleck strongly urged upon him a combined military and naval movement up the red river to alexandria or shreveport and the military occupation of northern texas he said that by adopting the line of the red river banks would retain his connection with his own base and separate still more the already dissevered sections of the confederacy and also cut off the sources of a supply from texas to northern louisiana and arkansas a considerable interchange of views took place between banks and halleck banks objected to the movement inland by the river on account of low water and other reasons that were afterwards proved to be sound and preferred a movement upon texas by way of the coast he decided to make a descent at sabine pass where the river sabine which forms the boundary between louisiana and texas empties into the gulf thence he expected by a rapid march to occupy the town of houston the capital of texas which was less than a hundred miles from sabine it was the fifth of september before the preparations for the expedition could be completed on that day four thousand troops under general w b franklin sailed from new orleans convoyed by four light draft vessels the transports got to the pass on the morning of the seventh and the gunboats in the evening the next day the gunboats engaged the fort unsuccessfully the clifton and the sachem after considerable damage had been done to them hauled down their flags the army abandoned the expedition and withdrew with the two uninjured gunboats this expedition having failed banks immediately tried to carry out the instructions of the government by a movement westward from bayou teche but becoming aware of the impracticability of this scheme before his preparations had made much progress he gave it up and resolved instead upon the occupation of the country at the mouth of the rio grande he organized a small force under the command of general n j t dana and accompanied by three naval vessels sailed the twenty sixth of october eighteen sixty three on the second of november he landed at brazos santiago the next day he drove away a force of the enemy which was stationed there and on the sixth his advance occupied brownsville with very little delay he moved northward along the coast in the direction of galveston occupying port isabel on the eighth of november and the troops were transported to mustang island which lies between corpus christi bay and the gulf the confederate works commanding aranzas pass were handsomely carried by general t e g ransom and the whole force now under general c c washburn moved upon pass caballo commanding the entrance to matagorda bay which was defended by fort esperanza a strong and well-manned fortification before the investment of this work was completed the confederates on the thirtieth of november evacuated it escaping by the long peninsula which leads to the mainland near the brazos river thus in a month banks had by good management and good fortune brought a large portion of the texas coast under the union flag but the formidable works at galveston and the mouth of the brazos still confronted him and he thought that to attack them successfully it would be necessary to march inland and approach them from the rear he was not ready for this but reported progress to washington and suggested an increase of his forces for further operations this proposition did not meet with general halleck's approval he had never favored the coastwise plan and he now renewed his suggestion of a movement up the red river coupling it with an offer of an additional force from sherman's army and a cooperating force under steele from arkansas banks says in his report that he did not feel at liberty to decline participation in the campaign thus repeatedly pressed upon him especially as halleck informed him that the best military opinions of the generals of the west favored it he therefore concurred in the scheme and promised cordial cooperation previous to undertaking it however he required major d c houston chief engineer of the department to prepare a memorandum detailing the difficulties in the way of a campaign on the red river and the measures indispensable for meeting them it was easier to foresee the obstacles than overcome them 
and the expedition started at last lacking one may say all the conditions of success as general banks was occupied at the time with duties connected with the establishment of a state government for louisiana the organization of the expedition was left in the hands of general w b franklin an officer of high reputation and ability the preparations consumed more time than was expected and it was not until the early days of march that the final arrangements were made w t sherman on his return from his march across mississippi and back visited banks at new orleans and promised him ten thousand men for the expedition who were to meet him at alexandria on the seventeenth this force was merely lent to banks for thirty days from the time they actually entered red river and were in no event to go beyond shreveport over steele's forces banks had no control whatever and received no assistance from them through the delay and the ill luck which marked every step of the enterprise the troops did not get off at the time appointed and only reached alexandria on the twenty fifth of march sherman's detachment under general a j smith was at the mouth of the river on the eleventh where a powerful fleet under d d porter was awaiting him and the next morning the gunboats started up the river the troops following in transports on the thirteenth smith's forces landed at simsport on the atchafalaya and the next day assaulted and captured fort de russy with two hundred sixty prisoners and ten guns porter's fleet moved up the river bursting their way through the obstructions with great energy and arrived at alexandria on the fifteenth and sixteenth smith's force also coming up on a latter day one day better than their promise this good fortune was however counterbalanced by the recall by general mcpherson of ellet's marine brigade an excellent organization the loss of which reduced the strength of the advancing column nearly three thousand men evil omens multiplied at alexandria the river which ordinarily at that season is at a high stage of water was very low some of the transports and gunboats were unable to pass the falls and return to mississippi it became necessary to establish a depot of supplies at alexandria and a line of transportation between the vessels below and those above the falls this further reduced the force of banks more than he could afford steele's force was of no use to him and with these subtractions from his marching strength there was already no great discrepancy of numbers between him and kirby smith who had the enormous advantage of fighting on the defensive and of being acquainted with every inch of the ground which was an unknown wilderness to banks there was of course the valuable help of the navy but when the time of crisis came the navy was out of reach while banks was at alexandria he received a letter from grant which would have justified him in an immediate return to new orleans it enforced upon him the prompt return of sherman's detachment at the time specified even if such a course should lead to the abandonment of the main object of the expedition grant's mind was occupied with the opening of the spring campaign he said in a subsequent dispatch that he would much rather that the red river expedition had never been begun than that banks should be detained one day beyond the first of may in commencing the movement east of the mississippi fettered by such instructions as these with the days in which he was to be allowed to accomplish his difficult task numbered beforehand with his not too liberal forces diminishing every hour without as it afterwards appeared the confidence or regard of his subordinate officers general banks began his unfortunate march towards shreveport the army reached natchitoches eighty miles from alexandria on the second and third of april the fleet and the transports with smith's corps and the stores arriving at the same time at grand Accor, four miles away general banks had remained behind for a few days in alexandria where elections were held on the second for the union convention of louisiana he anticipated no serious resistance short of shreveport his information led him to believe that the enemy was fortifying the sabine river so far from apprehending a battle on the way to shreveport he was only anxious lest he should not be able to obtain one there he wrote in this vein to washington and mr lincoln 
with that instinct of the approach of bad news which seemed like a sixth sense in him said i am sorry to hear this tone of confidence the next news we shall hear from there will be a defeat general banks joined the army as soon as the election was over he was not alone in his feeling of confidence no such preparations were made as to indicate that the subordinate generals expected any serious interruption in their long march of a hundred miles from natchitoches to shreveport through a barren sandy country with little water and less forage the greater portion an unbroken pine forest traversed by a narrow wood road on the sixth of april the army moved towards shreveport general a l lee with the cavalry in advance followed by the infantry of banks's army under the immediate command of general franklin under whom were generals ransom and w h emory and colonel w h dickey with a colored brigade a j smith's detachment followed a day's journey behind and a division under general t kelby smith accompanied admiral porter on the river as a guard for the transports the order of march was severely criticized after the event immediately behind the cavalry came their unwieldy train blocking up the narrow road and leaving no space free in front of the infantry the column wound wearily on among the dense woods on a single execrable road encumbered by twelve miles of wagons bearing the provisions and ammunition of the army in the heart of a hostile wilderness it was inevitable that when the head of this loose-jointed column struck against any serious obstacle disaster should follow the confederates under general richard taylor had been falling back before the union advance all the way up the river he had received on the twenty first of march at henderson's hill a severe blow from a force under general j a mower who surprised his camp in a storm of rain and captured his only cavalry regiment destitute for the moment of horse he retired still further on the road to shreveport until he came to the village of mansfield where he halted and occupied the roads leading to texas and to shreveport from which he received heavy reinforcements thomas green's cavalry being a welcome arrival from the south being now strong enough to dispute the narrow road with banks he moved out to sabine crossroads and there formed line of battle with the divisions of j g walker alfred mouton and green eleven thousand effectives by confederate reports with five thousand men of price's army general kirby smith says within one day's march of him this army fully equal to that which was struggling towards it through the dense forest was drawn up in a position that doubled its effectiveness in the edge of the woods commanding a rather wide clearing all day the seventh of april general lee had been skirmishing with green's cavalry who made such resistance to the union advance as was necessary to allow taylor to make his preparations for battle undisturbed a little after midday lee who had asked for and received two brigades of infantry under ransom from general franklin came upon the enemy in position and in force and at the same time general banks who had been riding forward all day through his scattered army trying to hurry them on came upon the field he saw at once the threatening aspect of affairs told lee to hold his ground and sent urgent orders for the rest of the troops to come up but it was already too late it was not indeed the intention of kirby smith that a decisive battle should be fought at that place he wished merely that a thorough reconnaissance should be made taylor himself thought he was confronted only by cavalry at least as late as noon of the day of battle and in effect when the shock came the resistance made to the confederate attack amounted to little more about four o'clock mouton's division attacked with great energy on the left of the road and walker on the right and after a short contest the cavalry of lee and their slender infantry supports gave way general ransom being wounded and fled to the rear where they were instantly mingled in an inextricable confusion with cavalry trains an attempt was made to stay the rout by r a cameron's division of the thirteenth corps which came upon the field at five o'clock accompanied by general franklin but the effort was ineffectual the whole force dissolved in disorderly retreat 
the infantry and cavalry streamed to the rear as they could in chaotic confusion and the confederates reaped a rich harvest of wagons and guns a little before nightfall emory's division of the nineteenth corps came up and formed across the road about three miles from where the fight began the routed mass of men horses and wagons poured down the road which was left open for their retreat and taylor's successful force rushing on in hot pursuit was brought to a stand by emory and checked until night came on banks made no mistake in recognizing the full extent of his mishap he could not after this check fight his way to shreveport within the time allowed by general grant and another defeat on his present ground which was not improbable in view of the heavy force of the enemy and the broken condition of his own command would be an irreparable disaster to both army and navy he therefore gave the order to fall back on pleasant hill which was done in the early morning of the ninth of april a j smith's force was there and what was left of lee's and ransom's now under command of cameron these forces the black brigade under dickey and emory's division which was in good spirits from the success of the night before were put in position to await the attack of taylor he set out in pursuit as soon as the morning light showed him that banks had retreated the confederates had been reinforced in the night by t j churchill's and m m parsons divisions mouton had been killed in the onset of the day before and his division was commanded by c j polignac taylor after skirmishing for several hours attacked at five o'clock his first serious blow falling on the union left where colonel lewis benedict was killed and his brigade outflanked and routed for a moment it looked as if the disaster of sabin crossroads was to be repeated but emory and mower stood firm and checked the advancing enemy and rallying charged in their turn and drove back the entire confederate line general kirby smith himself says taylor's troops were repulsed and thrown into confusion and adds that they were completely paralyzed by their repulse inspirited by this decisive success banks's first impulse was to move again upon shreveport in pursuit of taylor's beaten forces but the representations of all his generals with the exception of a j smith induced him to continue his retrograde movement to grand accor the reasons given for this determination were the absence of water the fact that the provision trains were already far in the rear and could not be reversed promptly in the single forest road the impracticability of ascending the river in the low water and the consequent danger of the loss of the fleet the diminished numbers of the army and the rigorous orders of grant against keeping smith's force a moment beyond the time specified in their loan he sent word for the fleet to return and on the tenth the army went back to grand accor the fleet had worked its way up the river to springfield landing on the tenth and immediately after received news of the disaster of sabine crossroads they started down the river at once but were greatly annoyed by constant attacks from confederates on either shore they had a severe fight on the fifteenth lasting some two hours a large force of general thomas green's cavalry with field artillery attacked the fleet from the right bank and tried to capture a transport which had disabled her wheel this unprecedented battle resulted in a severe defeat for the confederates green was killed and some seven hundred of his force killed and wounded the admiral and kilby smith joined the army at grand accor the next day the river was now falling rapidly and the condition of the fleet was becoming most critical banks received the letter from general grant already mentioned expressly forbidding anything which should prevent his return to new orleans later than the first of may the only business before him therefore was to see to the safety of the fleet and then abandon the expedition the fleet was brought to the falls of alexandria in safety through the bold and energetic efforts of the admiral and his officers the eastport the finest ship in the fleet was sunk by a torpedo and although she was raised and kept afloat for fifty miles by tremendous exertions on the part of her gallant commander s l phelps she finally grounded on a raft of logs at montgomery and had to be blown up 
admiral porter who after seeing the rest of the fleet safe to alexandria had gone back with three small gunboats to the rescue of the east port had to fight every inch of his way back his little vessels were riddled with shots from the confederate artillerymen on the bank and on the admiral's flagship in one fight the pilot was wounded and the engineer killed at the same moment few passages of the war called for more courage and skill than were displayed by admiral porter and his brave subordinates in that little known but most difficult achievement of the withdrawal of the fleet from grand accor the army got safely back to alexandria on the twenty sixth after a brilliant engagement with a confederate force under general h p b at cane river in which b was quickly and thoroughly defeated on arriving at alexandria banks found general david hunter awaiting him with peremptory dispatches ordering him to bring his expedition to an end without delay general a j smith whose thirty days had expired was naturally anxious to return to sherman but banks feeling that the rescue of the fleet was a matter of prime importance refused to allow him to go general mcclernand arrived on the twenty ninth bringing reinforcements from matagorda by order of general grant general hunter went away on the thirtieth with dispatches giving a full account of the situation and later banks received a dispatch from halleck dated the same day countermanding the order for the abandonment of the expedition but these dispatches had now little value on either side the water was so low that the gunboats could not ascend the river which put an advance out of the question the whole energies of the army were devoted to the one object of saving the fleet which was in a position of the gravest danger it was the season of the year when according to all precedent the river should have been at high water but as if the forces of nature were at league with the enemy to make the national disaster complete the long line of the falls about a mile in extent showed a mass of jagged rocks above the surface while the water in the channel gave a depth in its shallowest parts of less than four feet the current was extremely swift running about ten miles an hour most men in the army and navy thought of nothing but to wait where there were in the slightest hope of a providential rise of the river which would allow the vessels to pass the falls and gain the navigable water below alexandria but there was one man who knew perfectly well what to do and how to do it this was lieutenant colonel joseph bailey of the fourth wisconsin serving on general franklin's staff as chief engineer he had had large experience in building dams in the northwest and had floated and saved two confederate transports which the army found lying in the mud near port hudson during the entire campaign his mind had been preoccupied with the peril in which the constantly falling water would involve the navy the ascent of the river had been hard enough and attended with danger at every step the water had since then fallen six feet with no signs of a rise the fleet was inevitably lost if the army should retire nothing but a dam could save it yet the difficulties in the way of a dam seem almost insuperable at the point just above the lower chute which bailey's intelligent eye had selected the river was seven hundred fifty eight feet wide with a fall of six feet below he had to effect a rise of about seven feet to save the fleet he was sure he could do it he found no difficulty in persuading general franklin of the feasibility of his plan but admiral porter general franklin says derided the project bailey sure of himself persisted and with the aid of franklin presented his plan to banks and hunter without any certainty of success but anxious to avail himself of every possible expedient banks gave the necessary orders and details and the whole army in an efficient detail from the fleet turned in to accomplish the formidable task we believe there is no record of a work of equal importance performed in so short a time the dam was begun on the thirtieth of april and finished on the eighth of may on the north side of the river a dam was constructed of trees laid with their tops towards the current cross-tied with heavy timbers and weighted with all the heavy material available on the south as timber could not be obtained heavy cribs were constructed from the proceeds of the demolition of some ruined mills and barns and filled with brick and stone and all the iron that could be found 
between the crimps and the tree dam the vacant space a hundred fifty feet was filled by sinking four large coal barges across the stream the men worked with the greatest patience and enthusiasm standing waist deep in the water under a broiling sun by day and in the lurid light of flambeau and fires by night amid the jeers of the disloyal and the doubting the work went on and not until a week had passed was there any general belief in its success by the eighth of may the results were so evident in the rapidly rising water that no doubt remained the next day the fleet could have been brought down to the chute but in the morning the tremendous pressure of the pent-up waters began to force the coal barges out of place not an instant was to be lost admiral porter jumped on a horse and galloped at headlong speed to the upper fall and ordered the lexington to go through them and then to run for the dam she got over the upper fall and rushed with a full head of steam for the opening in the dam in the midst of breathless silence from the thousands of spectators on the shore she entered the gap pitched down the roaring torrent made two or three spasmodic rolls hung for a moment on the rocks below and was swept into deep water by the current and rounded to safely into the bank thirty thousand voices rose in one deafening cheer the neo show followed next her pilot became alarmed and stopped his engine as he approached the roaring abyss the ship plunged under the water for a moment but rose and was swept on by the current little damaged two more vessels came through successfully but by this time the water had fallen so far that no more could make the passage bailey undeterred by this mischance simply left a gap of fifty-five feet at the lower dam built a series of wing dams at the upper falls by which all the water of the river was turned into a narrow channel and in this way a sufficient rise was obtained to bring all the vessels over in safety on the thirteenth of may bailey was made a brigadier-general and thanked by congress for this valuable service and the officers of the mississippi squadron gave him a sword of honor he earned new laurels a few days afterwards when the army and fleet were on their way to new orleans by bridging the atchafalaya at simsport with boats on the eighteenth of may a sharp engagement took place between a j smith's command and the confederates under the lead of polignac and wharton in which the latter was repulsed on the twentieth at simsport general banks gave up the command of the troops to general e r s canby who had been put in charge of the military division of the west mississippi general banks retained command of the department of the gulf we prefer not to enter into the bitter discussions to which this disastrous campaign gave rise on both sides of the line a lifelong quarrel sprang up between kirby smith and taylor between banks and porter while franklin charles p stone banks's chief of staff and albert l lee all of whom relinquished their commands out of their quota of misunderstanding and resentment leaving out all questions of mutual recriminations it seems that the statement made by general banks in march eighteen sixty five gives in the fewest possible words the causes of the failure of the expedition the difficulties of navigation the imperfect concentration of forces the incautious march of the eighth of april and a limited time allotted to the expedition the committee on the conduct of the war made an investigation of the matter in the year eighteen sixty five at the time when the antagonism between mr lincoln and the radicals in relation to the subject of reconstruction had assumed an acute form and they seized upon the occasion to deal a severe blow at the president and secretary of state for ordering the expedition and at banks whose obedience to the president's orders in setting on foot the civil administration of louisiana was regarded by senators chandler and wade and representatives julian and lone as an interference with the prerogative of congress for his conduct of it we have shown in another place how important were the intrigues and designs of foreign powers in relation to texas which seemed to lincoln and seward sufficient reason for wishing the flag set up in that state even at some sacrifice 
the charge was made by the committee against banks that what he had in view was to carry out measures for the establishment of a state government in louisiana and to afford an egress for cotton and other products of that region and that the attention directed to the accomplishment of these objects exerted an unfavorable influence on the expedition the four members of the committee mentioned above united in this report of censure and mr gooch presented a minority report wholly dissenting from this opinion we have fully noticed in another place the measures taken by banks for the establishment of a state government in louisiana these were mainly taken by order of the president and upon him and not upon the general should fall the responsibility of them the plan with which the committee charge him and which has been for twenty years the theme of endless criticism that of affording an outlet for cotton and other products was also within proper limits in accordance with the policy of the government the need for cotton was so great here and abroad that every proper means for obtaining it and therefore relieving the famine with which the world was suffering was eagerly embraced by the government in may eighteen sixty three general banks had urged upon the government a plan for the requisition of cotton in louisiana which he thought would have resulted in securing from fifty to one hundred million dollars worth of cotton on the lower mississippi this was to purchase cotton from its holders within the rebel lines through their friends in the union lines at the prices current where it was grown which was only a third or a quarter its value in liverpool the government to receive not only the cash profits on the transaction but the vastly greater advantage which would come from continuing to the world something like its normal supply of an indispensable product but this proposition did not receive the approval of the government and captured and abandoned property continued to be turned over to the officers of the war or treasury department according to the regulations promulgated from washington banks gave no permits or privileges to trade there were many vague charges of improper conduct made by prejudiced persons in the press and before the committee of congress but there was never any proof brought forward to contradict general banks's unqualified statement every dollar's worth of property that came into the hands of the army during this campaign was either appropriated to its use in kind by the proper officers of the commissary and quartermaster's department receipts being given therefore or transmitted to the chief quartermaster at new orleans and by him turned over to the treasury agents to be disposed of according to the laws of congress and the orders of the government when cotton or other property interfered with the transportation of any material of the army or of refugees negroes or troops upon the evacuation of the country it was thrown from the boats and abandoned upon the river levee to the enemy a large amount of cotton was seized by the navy and sent to cairo to be adjudicated under the prize law and the proceeds distributed among its captors which was regularly and legally done a vast quantity of cotton was burnt by the confederates to prevent it from falling into union hands reflections more or less severe were cast upon the president because two men appeared at alexandria bearing passes in his handwriting authorizing them to trade in cotton the pressure upon him to grant these permits was almost incredible and he sometimes though very seldom gave way to it a letter which he wrote in the summer of eighteen sixty three to a valued personal and political friend a man of great prominence in illinois shows the pressure he had to contend against i have received and read your pencil note i think you do not know how embarrassing your request is few things are so troublesome to the government as the fierceness with which the profits of trading in cotton are sought the temptation is so great that nearly everybody wishes to be in it and when in the question of profit controls all regardless of whether the cotton seller is loyal or rebel or whether he is paid in cornmeal or gunpowder the officers of the army in numerous instances are believed to connive and share the profits and thus the army itself is diverted from fighting the rebels to speculating in cotton 
and steamboats and wagons in the pay of the government are set to gathering and carrying cotton and the soldiers to loading cotton trains and guarding them the matter deeply affects the treasury and war departments and has been discussed again and again in the cabinet what can and what cannot be done has for the time been settled and it seems to me i cannot safely break over it i know it is thought that one case is not much but how can i favor one and deny another one case cannot be kept a secret the authority given would be utterly ineffectual until it is shown and when shown everybody knows it the administration would do for you as much as for any other man and i personally would do some more than for most others but really i cannot involve myself and the government as this would do later when the war was ending and the evil consequences of this trade were greatly lessened the president gave a few of these permits strictly enjoining however upon the officers of the government civil and military that they were in no case to be allowed to interfere with military movements or the regular operations of the treasury among others permits were given to his old friend william butler of springfield and to thomas l casey the appearance of these two favored beings in a camp so full of suspicion and malevolence as that unhappy camp at alexandria produced a plentiful crop of fantastic fictions they had bought kirby smith they were scheming to elect banks or governor yates to the presidency with the money they were to coin out of their cotton the army was to be sacrificed the navy was to be robbed that these vampires might fatten on the ruin of the country butler and casey profited little by their permits and so far from commanding the army and navy in their cotton quest they were not allowed to keep the little cotton they collected both porter and banks agree in saying their cotton was taken away from them by the army and put to military uses some of it being worked into the famous dam on the red river there was of course more or less of the peculation and concussion which attend in the trail of a great war but in the midst of all the painful controversies that grew out of the red river mischance it is gratifying to know that no officer of rank in army or navy was shown to be guilty of any act of dishonesty the honorable poverty in which general banks has passed his subsequent life is the best answer to the reckless charges of his enemies End of chapter 11